Medical screening is one of the most important aspects of implant success. By properly screening your patients medically, you'll be able to perform your surgeries without worrying that there's going to be an emergency situation happening, without worrying that your implants are going to fall out during the healing process. You'll feel good knowing that you can provide the best possible care to your patient and know that you're well equipped to provide that care along with the management of complications that might arise with it. This is an example of a patient that came to my office. She said, I have $20,000 saved up. I want to start right away and I don't want anything removable. She also said she went to go see another surgeon and they said they can do it, but she said, I want you to do it. I want you to think about what you might say to her. Would the dollar signs flash before your eyes and you start treatment right away? I want you to look at her gums and see how inflamed they are. After you evaluate the personality fit for your practice, you decide that she's motivated and she's a serious patient, but now you need to evaluate the medical situation. So you want to ask her about her medical history. So this patient then tells you that she's diabetic. She, she's got type two diabetes. What would you ask her about her? What would you ask her or any other diabetic person to get a good understanding of their medical condition? What's the lab value that you want to know? So it's HbA1c. So HbA1c is a, it's a lab value. Um, so red blood cells have proteins inside them uh, called hemoglobin. When hemoglobin binds to glucose, it's said to be glycated. So the HbA1c is a measurement of the percentage of hemoglobin that's glycated. So that's like a reflection of the average sugar levels um, over a period of months. So that's a pretty good indicator of how severe the patient's diabetes is. So here's a chart straight from the MISH textbook. He classifies patients in terms of risk, mild, moderate, and severe. And those with HbA1c uh, of seven or lower are at a mild risk for, um, for complications. Those that are in the range of seven to 10 are at moderate risk. And those that have a HbA1c higher than 10 are said to be at a severe risk of implant complications. But you see these plus signs on the, on the side here? These plus signs indicate that he still felt it was possible to proceed with regular implant protocol for implant surgery. Um, the only category of patients that, um, that the MISH textbook, MISH up here, <laughs> that the MISH textbook uh, says to, uh, to not proceed is this category right here, the type 2 diabetic that has severe, um, that has severe diabetes and it's uncontrolled. So let's look at some literature just to be sure. There's a systematic review by, and I don't know how to pronounce this name, Naujukat. And I thought they did a great job of describing how diabetes affects implant success. They found that overall, there seems to be delayed osseointegration. So these are not the patients that you want to shortchange healing time. You don't want to, uh, they might want their tooth done faster. These aren't the kind of patients that you want to just say, okay, let's just take an impression after one month. You, you got to wait the full healing period for these patients. In this study, they propose that in the long term, implant survival might actually be lower uh, in diabetic patients than in non-diabetic patients. So in implant survival might be lower. Also, they note that diabetic patients have increased peri-implant inflammation. So there's going to be increased inflammation around your implants. The conclusion from the review was that good glycemic control can help improve osseointegration and implant survival. There's also some little tidbits that I thought were interesting from other studies. One uh, found that the highest failure rate was within the first year. Another found that all things being equal, implants uh, placed in patients with type 2 diabetes had higher success than those placed in implants with type 1 diabetes. Also, there was one more study. This one was way different from the others, and it says that there was actually no difference in the success rate between controlled and uncontrolled diabetes. And no difference at all. So this is actually really hard for me to believe because diabetes affects the healing process. So in, in particular, angiogenesis. And the more poorly controlled diabetes is, the more effective this process is. 
And uh, as we know, angiogenesis is essential for osseointegration. So I personally would not place too much weight on this last finding. So back to this patient. Um, when, uh, when you asked her about her HbA1c levels, she says, I don't know. I haven't been to the doctor in a while. So th that's a red flag right there. Um, when, when I asked her how, sh how well she feels she controls her diabetes with diet and exercise, she says, I gave up trying to control it. I eat whatever I want. I don't exercise because I don't think it makes a difference. I tried that before and, um, and my levels stayed the same. So I, I proceeded to ask this patient, would you be willing to try to get your diabetes under control and work with your physician to get on a diet and exercise plan? And she said, no. So this is a patient that does not seem motivated to take care of her health. I suspect if I do all this fancy work for her, she might not be motivated to take care of that either. The best way to make sure that you're successful is to see how resilient and determined and motivated the patient is to make a change. If the patient doesn't want to make a change and just wants other people to fix their problems, they might come back to you five, 10 uh, years from now and say, hey, you were supposed to fix this problem and now my implant fell out or I have bone loss. So I really don't think this is a good patient for you to commit to. Any patient that you're doing implants for, you're committing to them for a long time. And you want to make sure that you're partnering up with a patient that's going to take care of themselves. So any patient that's not motivated to take care of themselves, I'm not going to be able to help that person effectively. So this is kind of like my rule of treatment planning. You can only help patients who are willing to help themselves. So my first implant failure was actually on a diabetic patient. It was in the first year of my uh, prosthodontic residency and uh, you know I was just right out of dental school and so I'm like really like on top of uh, you know doing everything by the book and it's got to be the way that I learned it in my lecture and my textbooks and so I knew the um, I knew HbA1c was important so I asked the patient what's, he, what's her HbA1c value she said eight um, so I proceeded I, I placed implants at number it was number what was it 12 and 13 and um, you know, I placed implants on her. She came for her follow-up. Everything was good. I let her go heal up, you know, for for six months. And when she came back for the implant uncovery, so I can uncover the implant and then um, take an impression. I, I reflected a flap at 12 and 13, and I found 13, but I I just couldn't find number 12. Like the implant just was not there. Uh, I would just looked and looked and, you know, I, I poked around with an explorer. I thought maybe some bone had covered up the implant or something. And um, I just couldn't find it. So anyway, I, I took her to get a pan. Uh, so I took a pano on her, um, you know, with the flap, the flap reflected. And I looked at the pano and there's nothing there. There's, there's no implant. And the patient hadn't reported anything. You know, she didn't say anything fell out. Uh, when I told her, that the implant wasn't there. She she hadn't noticed that anything fell out of her mouth. So the entire implant had come out of her mouth at some point and she was unaware. Um, so anyway, I, I asked her about her medical situation at that point and she says that she had been to the doctor recently and that her HbA1c was actually 13. And she said that when she had told me prior at her implant surgery, she was just estimating. She ha actually hadn't been to the doctor in a while. And so at some point between the, you know, the placement of the implants and the, you know, the uncovery time, her HbA1c spiked up to 13. And so you know, that was my first experience uh, with failure and with, a, you know, with complications with the diabetic patient. And so for me, I'm, I'm always, um, always very aware and very, um, um, I'm always considering diabetic patients very carefully and screening them and trying to make sure that I work with them to keep their, their, um, their glucose under control. So anyway, um, that's enough of uh, diabetic patients. Now let's move on to the next portion of the medical screening.